I'm really delighted to address the Asia Society during this extraordinarily busy Anga Leaders Week and New York traffic is a joy to behold. But I'm pleased to be here this week because it gives me this opportunity to address the Asia Society and for over six decades the Asia Society has made a valuable contribution to strengthening relations between organisations and individuals in the United States and Asia with the aim of building a more prosperous, secure and peaceful Asia, contributing to global peace and prosperity. The decision of John D. Rockefeller to establish the Asia Society in 1956 was remarkably far-sighted. Like much of the world, Asia was recovering from the Second World War and was a theatre of Cold War competition. President Eisenhower, in his annual message to Congress on the State of the Union on 5th of January 1956, warned of the serious threat that communism posed to the free world and he pledged assistance to Asian nations struggling to maintain freedom against coercion and subversion. Having played such a significant role in winning the Second World War, the President was determined to win the battle for influence in what we've come to label the long peace that followed. In 1956, the economic ascent of Asia was in its infancy. For example, the combined GDP of Northeast and Southeast Asia, collectively known as East Asia, comprised around 15%. 15% of global GDP. The figure is now around 30% and could exceed 40% in a decade's time based on current trends. The region was also then extremely poor in absolute terms. The average GDP per capita in the United States was 13 times larger than in Asia, where more than 90% lived on $2 or less a day. Today, GDP cap per capita in the United States is less than five times larger than in Asia and poverty now afflicts less than 20% of people in the region. Despite Asia's remarkable economic rise, we should note that of the top 20 global economies in GDP per capita terms, if that's the best measure of prosperity and standards of living, only three are in Asia. Most are yet to reach the status of fully industrialised economies. There's obvious potential for even greater growth. As we reflect on the decades since the Asia Society was founded, we remain thankful that President Eisenhower's vision of freedom throughout Asia continues to inspire and support the aspirations of people in our region. Countries such as Japan and South Korea have emerged as exemplars for Asia and the global community of modern and prosperous democracies. In 2007, the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, ASEAN, adopted its charter, which includes aspirations to strengthen democracy, enhance good governance and the rule of law, and promote and protect human rights and fundamental freedoms. The ASEAN Charter reflects what's been repeated many times over six decades. Domestic stability and enduring prosperity is most likely in societies with strong liberal institutions and political, personal and economic freedoms. It's worth noting that history shows all the high income economies in the world to date are liberal democracies, with the exception of several oil-rich states. As economic power moves from west to east, Australia is located in what is the most economically dynamic region in the world. This dynamism will continue, or not, depending on the wisdom, decisions and determination of leaders, governments and populations. Even allowing for North Korea's threatening and destabilising behaviour and its illegal ballistic missile and nuclear programs, we enjoy relative peace and stability in Asia. To a large extent, the prospects for continued peace and stability depend upon our capacity to manage the consequences of rising prosperity and wealth. It's overwhelmingly a blessing. However, 
growing individual and national wealth and the demand and expectations for that to continue presents challenges. Many parts of Asia, Asia are rapidly ageing. The number of people over the age of 70 in Asia is due to more than treble over the next three decades, from about 207 million now to over 677 million. For example, Japan, South Korea and Singapore will have one of the highest median ages in the world over the next two decades. China confronts the most dramatic challenge. When the country was still in the middle of its rapid growth phase two decades ago, there were approximately six workers for every retiree. By 2030, there could be as few as two workers for every retiree. This makes the challenge for developing Asian nations to get rich before they get old, avoid the middle income trap, harness the opportunities that come from an emerging middle class. From the 1960s onward, the region has largely become more prosperous on the back of industrial export-oriented models of rapid development pioneered most effectively by Japan. Cheaper and willing surplus labour in the region was utilised to build and assemble manufactured products for the world, and that export-led model is now going through a transition. Products were made in Asia for the world's largest consumer markets in the US and Europe. Today, the largest emerging middle class, consumer class, is in Asia. Managing that transition from a greater reliance on exports to domestic consumption will not be an easy task. Another challenge for the region, as it is for the rest of the world, is the disruption from the sheer scale and pace of technological advances. We're entering the fourth industrial revolution, or what many experts call the second machine age. The disruptive effects of advanced manufacturing technologies, uh, robotics, automation, 3D printing, and exponential improvements in artificial intelligence will make many traditional jobs and industries obsolete while creating new industries and fields of employment. Some predictions are that within a decade, one third of jobs in existence now are at risk of being replaced by software, robots, and smart machines. Jobs most at risk in the medium term are those entailing predictable, repetitive work. This may free many people from these jobs, but the challenge will be to find more fulfilling work for those who lose their jobs. Uh, My Innovation Exchange, this is an ideas hub uh, that I set up within the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, has partnered with MIT and an Australian tech company called Atlassian to hold a global solvathon. You know, like a, an ideas challenge, to attract the most creative and innovative ideas for the skills that will be needed for young people, for the workforces of the future. Disruptive change will impact almost every sector and every economy over time. The reality is that economic and business models that worked well in the past will not be as relevant or effective in the future. This isn't new, however, it's the pace of change that will challenge societies and policy makers. Economies in the region can continue to grow if they're able to adapt and innovate, which will require nimble work from governments. A successful evolution into increasingly sophisticated consumer economies will not happen effortlessly or inevitably. Regional economies must become more efficient and creative in the way they do things and in some circumstances create entirely new markets to drive growth. Innovation will be rewarded and liberal principles such as the rule of law, property and intellectual property rights, more flexible regulatory environments and policies that support individual and private sector creativity will become even more important. It will also require greater contestability to ensure limited resources go to the most efficient and productive uses. This is Asia's domestic reform challenge. The need for reform is an economic imperative that is growing in urgency. Another aspect of rising national wealth is that it enables nations to invest more in their military. Defence outlays in the region expanded over 5.5% in the last financial year. 
Now that easily outpaced the 1% overall increase in global military spending. By 2020, the combined military budgets of Asian countries could exceed US $600 billion, which would match US military spending for the first time in at least 100 years. Rising national power also naturally leads to growing ambition. In a region where there are unsettled territorial disputes and pre-existing rivalries dating back decades, um, even centuries, peace and stability cannot be taken for granted. With its rapidly growing economy, which is already the second largest in the world and the largest military budget in Asia, much attention is focused on China. Its economic rise is one of the greatest success stories, certainly of recent history, with hundreds of millions of people lifted out of poverty. China is a crucial economic power and partner to the region and to the world. It's vital for China that it plays a constructive role, commensurate with its standing. And of course, China has additional responsibilities as a permanent member of the Security Council in terms of safeguarding international peace and security. Those who constructed the security and economic architecture in the region after the Second World War did so with the intention that Asia, freer and more prosperous over time, would promote, advocate and defend their own interests. With greater power and wealth comes responsibility to protect and strengthen the very system that supported that rise. The importance of the international rules-based order, liberal institutions and the role of the United States for the continuation of peace, stability and prosperity cannot be overstated. The rules-based order is not facing the same direct assault as during periods of the Cold War However, there is a growing tendency for nations to opportunistically bend or ignore international law and rules for narrow advantage and short-term gain. And the rules-based order will quickly fray if it's perceived that advantage can be gained by flouting it or working around it. We need to defend and strengthen the existing order so that the region and individual countries continue to rise economically. This international order is not designed to entrench past gains, protect existing privileges or constrain any country's rise. It serves to regulate rivalries and behaviour and ensure countries compete fairly and in a way that doesn't threaten others or destabilise the region. This order protects the rights of small and large countries by preventing stronger powers from arbitrarily imposing their will on less powerful countries. We support China playing a greater leadership role in reinforcing and strengthening that rules-based order because it's enabled its rise and continues to underpin its growing prosperity. There are multiple opportunities for regional states to lend their weight and voice to defending and advancing these principles. For example, the East Asia Summit provides the preeminent setting for countries to advocate for the principles that they value and wish to protect. And when ASEAN speaks confidently and with one voice, the authority and standing of that organisation and its member states are considerably enhanced. Australia is committed to strengthen the military and security arrangements in Asia as a further safeguard for peace. We're also exquisitely placed to partner with Asian countries as they continue to strengthen. We actually hold a world record. 26 consecutive years of uninterrupted economic growth. Our prosperity is due in part to our continuing quest for economic reform and conducive regulatory environments and our commitment to an open export-oriented market economy and the open trading system. We're a resources and energy superpower on track to become the largest LNG exporter in the world as well as a leading exporter of coal and uranium both essential for the energy needs of our region. Australia is also a major exporter of food and other agricultural products, beef, dairy, wine, all essential for food security. <laughs> but our greatest natural resource is our people and we provide high quality services for the region in education and tourism and finance and banking, design and technology. We are also a superpower, a lifestyle superpower, and I urge you to experience the delights of visiting Australia if you're not from Australia. We don't presume 
to tell other nations how to regulate or govern themselves. However, we can offer the benefit of our experiences and lessons learned. Conversely, there is much we can learn from our friends in Asia. I consider that one of our most valuable investments in our engagement with Asia comes from a student initiative that I established in 2014 known as the New Colombo Plan. There was an original Colombo Plan back in the 1950s which enabled young people in Asia to study in Australia and gain qualifications from our universities to equip them with the skills to help them rebuild their nations after the devastation of the Second World War. Over 30 years, about 40,000 overseas students studied in Australia under the original Colombo Plan, and many of them have gone on to become business and community and political leaders in our region. The new Colombo Plan offers opportunities for Australian undergraduate students to live in and study at institutions in any one of our 38 partner countries in the Indian Ocean, Asia Pacific, uh, from Mongolia in the west to Marshall Islands in the east and all nations in between. The time spent at Asian universities is recognised by our universities towards the completion of their degree in Australia. And what makes this program particularly special is that students are also offered an opportunity to undertake work experience, internships and practicums in the host country. Some countries have actually changed their visa regulations to allow our, to allow our new Colombo Plan students to undertake this work. Companies and businesses and NGOs and government departments are offering our students the opportunity to see how they operate. They're giving them the most extraordinary chance to experience the economic, political and social life of the host country. My plan is for our students to return to Australia more Asia literate with new perspectives and insights and new skills, language skills, that will better equip them as our leaders for the future. And over the first five years of its life, the new Colombo Plan will have supported over 30,000 Australian students to live, study and work in our region. Importantly, they will develop friendships, create networks, gain an understanding of the region that will last a lifetime. This will help ensure that our regional relationships flourish and endure. Before the end of the year, I will release the Australian Government's foreign policy white paper. It will be our first foreign affairs blueprint since 2003, and the white paper will provide a framework to guide our decisions on international engagement in a more complex and contested world. Ladies and gentlemen, Asia is a remarkable and dynamic region with a rich history. It has come far in recent decades and has the potential to reach greater heights. Australia will continue to work closely with our great friends, including the United States and our partners in the region, to ensure that the best days for peace and prosperity lie ahead of us. Thank you. Well, welcome to the Asia Society, everybody. Welcome, Julie. It's good to have you here. Uh, Julie and I have been parliamentary sparring partners in the Australian Parliament for a number of years, in one form or another. It's good to see you in the job, and good to see you here at the Asia Society. Um, how's the job going? Fabulous. <laughs> the, um, I was taken by... Uh, you didn't take that very far, did you? <laughs> How much more do you want me to say? <laughs> As much as you'd like. The, um... I know where you're going with this. <laughs> no, you don't. The, uh... <laughs> oh, yes, I do. <laughs> the, um... We've done this routine before. <laughs> <laughs> We've done it many times before. The, uh, I like the idea of a solvathon. That's kind of interesting. When I was Foreign Minister of Australia, I found it a problem a thon. So, uh, how's the solvathon going? Well, actually, it's one of 80 projects that we have underway. And the reason we set up the Innovation Exchange was I became frustrated by the fact that notwithstanding we were investing billions of dollars over decades in countries in our immediate region, many of them were going backwards in terms of 
the Millennium Development Goals, you know, mm. maternal health and literacy and numeracy and the like. And I mm. thought, how can this be? So we set up this innovation hub to come up with creative ideas on how to better deliver aid into our region. And it's been just incredible to see the number of um, companies and businesses and governments who want to partner with us in some of these global challenges. So we'll come up with an intractable development issue and then we'll put seed funding behind it. We'll hold a global challenge, garner the best ideas from around the world and sometimes we get you know, literally hundreds and hundreds of proposals and ideas and then we'll narrow it down with expert advice to a group that we will then um, help pilot, scale up their ideas and if they work we'll roll them out across the region. Now governments are by nature risk averse. This means mm. accepting risk, acknowledging that things can fail but instead of covering it up with more funding we say okay that's not going to work let's do something differently. Mm. So the, um, the partnerships that we've created, I'll, I'll just mention one because of um, the fact that we're in New York, and um, Bloomberg, Bloomberg Philanthropies have partnered with us in a Data for Health program where we are carrying out, for the first time, a national health census in 20 developing countries to put together the evidence that you need to develop an effective health system. There are mm. many countries, Kevin, as you would know, that don't even collect data on mm. cause of death. I mean, how do you put in place health policies if you don't have the evidence mm. that um, would underpin it. So this is all happening through our innovation exchange. Have a look at it on our website. I shall now, now that I know about it. It sounds uh, like a good initiative. Uh, kudos, by the way, for the new Colombo plan. Uh, 30,000 kids, that's no small thing in uh, a small number of years. Uh, and the vision of making Australia increasingly Asia literate. Thank you for also keeping the Australia Awards, which are still running for foreign students coming uh, to Australia. Um, you've just been down the UN. Um, what's the government's uh, approach to UN engagement? If you were to try to sum up where you see the UN fitting in the spectrum of your foreign policy priorities. Indeed, at um, the UN this week and again today uh, when I delivered the national statement, I have been reiterating our support for the UN as the defender and guarantor of the international rules-based order about which I just spoke. And yes, it does need reform, and yes, we are supporting uh, the United States and others in um, implementing reform along with Secretary General Gutierrez. <coughs> uh, it has to be more effective, it has to be more efficient and accountable and transparent. But if the United Nations did not exist, you would have to create it. Mm. So I have, uh, as you know, have um, campaigned for Australia to serve on the UN Human Rights Council. Um, we are now about to campaign for Australia to serve on the World Heritage Council. So we do see the um, effectiveness of uh, this multilateral institution. And I have also focused quite significantly on the role of UN peacekeepers. And as you know, Kevin, Australia has long been a supporter of UN mm. peacekeeping missions. Um, often they're all that stands between mm. um, a country uh, prospering and becoming a failed state. So we continue to um, celebrate our 70 years of peacekeeping missions and without the UN backing, of course, this just would not be possible. I listened carefully to your speech before. If I was trying to summarise it, you were talking primarily about what's confronted many of us around the world, which is the great Asian paradox. This place which has become this global dynamo and the generation of not just regional but global economic activity, a huge contributor to global growth. Gavin Marshall, former Senator of the Commonwealth of Australia, good to see you here. Um, so you've had uh, the uh, region become not just, you know, moving from poverty to prosperity but now frankly becoming the generator of global growth. At the same time, all the part of the paradox is the unresolved security dilemmas, none of which have resolved and a number of which have got worse. From an Australian perspective, I mean, do you see uh, a continuing and increasing role for Oz in how you constructively contribute to, let's call it, bringing down 
uh, regional security policy tensions uh, in order to sustain, let's call it, the miracle of the last several decades. Very much so. I think Australia has a significant role to play in supporting uh, organisations like ASEAN, such an important part of the regional architecture, and next year we'll be hosting the first ASEAN Australia Leaders Summit in Sydney. Uh, we are an active participant in the East Asia Summit, given that it has you know, the right players and the right mandate to focus on uh, regional security issues. Um, bilaterally, we are deepening our defence engagement with a number of nations in the region. And, you know, the, the global threat of terrorism has brought many nations much closer together and there's a sharing of information and intelligence with nations that you might not otherwise have thought we would mm. um, undertake such activity. But the um, global challenges that confront us in the region um, bring us closer together and I think Australia being a, you know, one of the G20, one of the most um, developed countries in the region, has a responsibility to play. Our particular focus has been the Pacific and I want to ensure that Australia remains the partner of choice for countries in the Pacific for their defence, security and other needs uh, so that um, we can ensure that that remains a region of peace, stability and tranquility. It's had its moments. Uh, so yes, Australia does have a significant role to play. Um, even with an issue as global in its um, possibilities as the threat from North Korea, I believe that we are a credible and principled voice um, in supporting action that must be taken. Before we move on to North Korea, do you mind if I throw you a slightly wild question about us here? Do you mind if I choose or not to yeah. answer? <laughs> yeah. You can use the well-trusted Australian parliamentary technique, which I deployed often in Parliament, which was simply to duck and weave. I noted that. Yeah, so <laughs> you can appear to be answering the question, well, not actually answering the question. I'm sure this is foreign to American politics. The, uh, on the ASEAN question, I've had a few private conversations with ASEAN leaders over the years about <clears throat> would the day come when it would either be in Australia's interest or ASEAN's interest for Australia to become a member of ASEAN? Mm. That's the wild question. Would you like to duck or weave? ASEAN membership is um, clearly very prized by the um, member states and they don't admit new members easily or readily. And I know there are a number of um, nations, not, not many, but there are a number of nations who see themselves as naturally a partner of ASEAN and I've noted that ASEAN hasn't fallen over themselves to include them in the group. I think that the Southeast Asian nations would feel that the group would lose its um, relevance if it extended beyond uh, the ten members and they feel that they can... Could they start with Tassie? <laughs> Tasmania, the island state. I thought you were going to say Queensland. That's his home state. Um, and I think that they would rather that architecture remain and that we have forums like the ASEAN Regional Forum, which um, we all come along to, the East Asia Summit, at which they are the core. So as much as I would like to become a member of ASEAN, um, it's manners to wait until you're invited. Well said. The... Um Going further north uh, to North Korea, and you've been at the UN all week, you've had uh, multiple meetings, including uh, with the President of the United States. Uh, where do you see North Korea now going? <clears throat> um, you've been very forward-leaning with your language uh, on North Korea. In office, I was much the same. Um, I think most of us have seen this thing rolling down the road, and it's just arrived. And no one's ever had a magical solution in their back pocket. But given the verbal barrage in both directions between Washington and Pyongyang in the last several days, <clears throat> do you see us uh, now entering a deepening phase of the crisis where you know, that horrible possibility of conflict is no longer theoretical but real? I believe that North Korea can be deterred from its current trajectory, which is clearly to build the capability of an intercontinental ballistic missile 
uh, with a miniaturised nuclear weapon attached that is capable of reaching the United States. I mean, clearly that would give North Korea unparalleled, unparalleled leverage. Uh, I believe it can be deterred from that path uh, and brought back to the negotiating table, but it's going to take an enormous amount of political and diplomatic and economic pressure. Um, I actually believe that uh, oil is the game changer in the sanctions regime. Uh, China is clearly open to using its undoubted leverage, economic leverage, mm. I'm not suggesting diplomatic, but economic leverage over North Korea. And from my discussions with um, the US administration, I'm confident that US and China are engaged in very serious dialogue about how they're going to bring North Korea to the negotiating table. It's worth noting that up until the Trump administration's inauguration, China was of the view that this was not their problem, this was an issue between Pyongyang and Washington. Hmm. I think China has now become part of the uh, <coughs> group working on the solution and I have been stressing particularly its unique role as a member of the Permanent Five of the Security Council because North Korea is in flagrant violation of numerous Security Council resolutions. It is the responsibility of the Permanent Five to uphold the authority of the Security Council. So rather than point the finger at China and say, you have the economic leverage, you must solve this, I'm appealing to China as part of the Security Council to say this is a matter of um, the flouting of the authority of the United Nations. All nations have an investment in you, up you and the other four upholding the authority of the Council. So I think that um, economic sanctions will get tougher. The United States has announced they'll do more. I believe China will do more. Um, we need Russia to be inside the tent and Australia, of course, will play its part. Uh, what does North Korea ultimately want? Uh, well, I think um, the Kim dynasty to survive and for it to take its place as a, um, an equivalent nuclear power. That's unacceptable to um, Japan, South Korea and others. Um, so a solution must be found, and I read your article that was published in The Australian, a solution must be found whereby we can denuclearise North Korea, um, have stability on the Korean Peninsula and um, ensure that this security threat can be abated. It's quite an elegant summary really in terms of the, the migration of the Chinese position in not, little more than six months really. From <clears throat> not my problem to regrettably it's all of our problem. <clears throat> Do you see um, uh, what I found most fascinating about that last round of UN Security Council uh, sanctions was now the opening references to oil, um, mm. which uh, in my historical dealings with the Chinese has always been, you know, no way Jose. That's not a Chinese expression. <laughs> uh, the, uh, but uh, uh, so uh, uh, you finding now the dialogue with our Chinese friends is beginning to become more uh, substantive on what they can do? Very pragmatic in terms of um, the influence that they can bring to bear on this issue. You'll note that the first um, round of sanctions on the 5th of August were the toughest and most comprehensive we'd seen to date. Up until now, as you'd know, the sanctions had been against individuals and entities. Mm. Now they're against entire sectors of the North Korean economy. And the sanctions on the 11th of September um, are specific um, in terms of China's connection. I mean, textiles, the prohibition on textiles, that's essentially into China. Mm. Uh, the prohibition on LNG imports, that's essentially by China. Uh, the foreign workers, the prohibition on foreign workers, that's essentially China. Um, and now the mention of um, oil, a reduction by 30%, is um, again uh, in China's domain. So I see China taking um, a degree of responsibility mm. for solving the problem and that, when the US and China and the P5 work together, that has to have an impact. 
Yeah, I couldn't agree with you more because it's so much um, the central dynamic in this. And I would have thought if you're Kim Jong-un, the single most stupid thing you could have done would have been to conduct your sixth nuclear test on the day that um, Xi Jinping is having the BRICS summit in Xiamen in China. If you really want to get up someone's nose, it's the perfect way to do it. Oh, and, and they had a test on the day of China's One Belt, One Road initiative hmm. and on the day China was uh, hosting the G20. So he's, uh, his pattern of behaviour is not endearing him to the Chinese leadership. And a few commentaries now emerging in China, as you've indicated, about should there be a reconsideration of the China, shall I say, historical view of North Korea. If we drift a little further south <clears throat> and, uh, uh, and uh, across the troubled Taiwan Straits, but then hit the, the Philippines, mm -hmm. uh, we were privileged last night to be in conversation with the Foreign Minister of the Philippines here, and we talked a lot about the problems in the south of the country. Uh, we looked, talked a lot about what can be done in terms of uh, the um, ISIS-related uh, insurgency and its relationship with pre-existing groups. What's the Oz view and what are we doing there with the Philippines government? Well, Kevin, interestingly, I have had two meetings with President <coughs> Duterte this year, one in um, Mindanao oh, okay. in March. I went down to his electorate, down to his um, area, and met with him there. And we talked about what I knew was an emerging... ISIS threat. Um, we had been informed by our usual security and intelligence agencies <laughs> and the usual means that uh, there was a, um, a significant connection between the um, ISIS group in Syria and Iraq and returning foreign fighters or inspiration um, coming from that terrorist group into the southern Philippines. And at that time, President Duterte talked about the conflict, but only in terms of uh, rebels and militia and criminal networks. I saw him again um, in July, and he was absolutely on top of the challenge. He knew that this was um, likely to be the next caliphate um, from the jihadists, and he had a completely different view of it. Uh, mm. Australia has been determined to support um, Philippines in eradicating this um, terrorist group before it takes hold and establishes a headquarters mm. in the southern Philippines because that would be a direct threat to Australia. And in fact, the more successful we are in Iraq and Syria in taking back the territory once held by um, ISIS, uh, returning foreign terrorist fighters may well be attracted to the southern Philippines and gain more skills there. So we're providing uh, defence um, air force surveillance, real-time information to the um, mm. Armed Forces Philippines. We are offering um, whatever support they need. I know the United States is doing similarly in terms of training because this is a different kind of warfare. Mm. This is urban warfare. Um, there's a mosque in um, Marawi. I mean, this siege of Marawi is in its fourth month. There's a mm. mosque in Marawi where uh, 300 people are being held hostage. So we um, sadly have experience in this kind of urban warfare in Afghanistan. And so we've offered um, assistance in training and um, assisting should they need it. Yeah, it seems the world is less focused on, or obviously more focused on Mosul than Mar Marawi. Mm. Whereas if Marawi were to have fallen. I mean, we would have mm. been uh, into a radically new set of uh, different circumstances. So I think even if our mob uh, were in uh, power in Australia, we'd be doing exactly what the government is now doing in terms of this insurgency with our friends and partners uh, in the Philippines. Uh, last set of questions from me before I move to the audience is, drifting a little further to the west, skipping over Indochina, <coughs> we arrive at a country called Myanmar. <coughs> and. Uh, you and I have spent a fair bit of time there over the years doing one thing or another. Um, and you see uh, the appalling humanitarian crisis in the Rakhine. <clears throat> we see the reporting of that. Um, um, uh, my own view is, and I'm interested to hear yours, is that uh, Aung San Suu Kyi, who spoke here last General Assembly, actually, uh, is being blamed for uh, everything. Um, in that country, whereas it's a much more complex picture in the domestic politics of Myanmar, if we know anything about the continuing role of the military and their effective power. What's the Australian view and what are we doing materially on the ground to assist? Well, it was with a very heavy heart that I attended a meeting called by Foreign Secretary Boris Johnson on Monday. 
uh, to discuss the deteriorating situation in Rakhine State uh, because there was a focus from some, who shall remain nameless, on Aung San Suu Kyi and the fact that she had failed to resolve this crisis. Now, um, I first met her back in 1995. Um, before me, my friend. Long before I went into Parliament. It oh. was, you know, I'll tell you about it. It'll be in my book. No, there's no book. No, there's no book. <laughs> uh, but I met her. I've got one coming. Another one? Mm. Um, um, I was so inspired by her lonely and courageous fight for freedom and democracy for the people of Burma. Well, you look back now and say, well, did that include the people of Rakhine State? And this is a, I think uh, the world is now confronted with the fact that while we embraced a civilian government in Myanmar, who's actually calling the shots? And I fear that Aung San Suu Kyi may be taking the blame for matters that are outside of her control. And I, I know she made a national statement uh, the other night, uh, which contained some very hopeful messages uh, but whether she can actually implement that is another question. Uh, we um, deplore the, the violence. Um, we've called on the security operations to cease. Uh, we want the Rohingyas who have sought sanctuary in Bangladesh to have the opportunity to go home. Um, we're providing humanitarian support through the World Food Program for those in um, and through Red Cross. Uh, for those in camps in Bangladesh, and we're providing the support to Bangladesh because we recognise that they're carrying the burden of this crisis. Uh, we have also, interestingly, now partnered with Indonesia, who is taking a lead on the relief efforts, but we've partnered with Indonesia and we're sending um, a team of our humanitarian and, and um, relief experts as part of an Indonesian team to uh, Bangladesh and uh, Rakhine State, and they are going to assess the needs on the ground. Um, we're also partnering with other um, nations, and, and I'll be able to make more announcements over time, but we're partnering with other nations in providing support to uh, the Rohingyas who are um, so desperately in need. We are also very supportive of UN Security Council resolutions. We're meeting with other nations about it. But um, clearly it has exposed the strength and influence of the military in Myanmar at a time when the world had been celebrating mm. its emergence <coughs> as, a, as a democracy. So it's a reality check that has come as a shock to mm. many, if you read you know, some of the press reports around the world, but it has uncovered a very complex and complicated history in Myanmar. And I have not condemned, you know, I have not used the words um, in condemning uh, the government because I can see that Aung San Suu Kyi can't be blamed for what's happening. She has to be part of the solution hmm. because otherwise we will be um, going back decades in terms of Myanmar's um, growth and prosperity. Yeah, it seems, I mean, consistent with your analysis, that we face the real possibility of uh, Aung San Suu Kyi's domestic political credibility being deliberately undermined by the Burmese military for not being nationalist enough, not being hardline enough against the Rohingya and Rakhine State. And at the same time, the military is sitting back and laughing quietly into their hands as Aung San Suu Kyi sees her international credibility shredded. Uh, for actions by the Burmese military over which she's got no internal control. And so the danger of therefore seeing the steps leading to another coup in one form or another. Now, folks, so uh, we've got to think about 10 minutes left for some questions. Uh, so um, um, I'm going to um, ask for a few in sequence and then leave it to the minister to pick and choose as she responds. Josette Sheeran, president of the Asia Society, uh, we'll open the batting. Uh, Josette, uh, formerly, for those of you who don't know her, was formerly head of the World Food Program uh, and uh, did a terrific job in that position over eight years as one of the most effective directors in its history. Josette. Madam Minister, good to see you again. When I was last in Australia, one of your uh, business leaders introduced me by saying, as you know, Australia is a nation that sits in between China and U United States and mediates um, equally between them. 
I know that is not necessarily the view of the government, but I'd be interested in your white paper, how you see China, the relationship with China. And we've seen in this administration in the U.S. a feeling that China is not contributing to the prosperity or security in Asia as much as it could or should, and your view and perspectives on that. But Julie, you take that one, and we'll heard some other ones sure. uh, after your answer. Uh, first, I want to thank you for your work with the World Food Programme. It um, is one of our uh, largest humanitarian partners, and I met with the new uh, executive director yesterday and committed Australia's continued um, support. Thank you. Um, there is a, a view amongst some commentators in Australia that we will be called upon to choose between our economic relationship with China, which is undoubtedly one of our most important, China is our largest trading partner, and our security and strategic relationship with the United States. I don't subscribe to that view. Um, we're not the only country that counts China as our largest trading partner. Probably about 120 countries around the world do, and of that number, many of them would see the United States as their security partner or indeed ally. So it's a situation that confronts not just Australia, but all. I believe that the relationship between the United States and China is the most important in the world today. And I believe that the um, balancing uh, is something that both nations understand must occur. Uh, the United States should not um, consider this as a challenge that they can't overcome by any means. Our, our region, for example, wants to see more US leadership, more US engagement in the region, not less. And likewise, um, China has benefited enormously from the international rules-based order that has been promoted and defended, guaranteed by the United States. And so I believe that there's an accommodation between the two that will work for peace and prosperity, and that's most certainly the view that we promote. Um, I'm interested in the idea that we mediate between China and the United States. I wouldn't, I wouldn't put it that way, but we most certainly want to be a friend to both. Other questions from the audience? Um, lady in front, the gentleman there and the gentleman there. Short questions if you could, our time's limited. Thank you. Uh, Joyce Slayton Mitchell, I work in uh, China most of the year on U.S. college admissions. And I've worked with some students in Abbotsley and the Ascom School. Um, <clears throat> I, it seems to me that it's wishful thinking to think that North Korea is going to come to the table for any reason at all until they have accomplish their nuclear power. Um, we had uh, Graham Allister here speaking about within the month. And in his book, uh, Destined for War, he pointed out that we could live, there's no need for us to act as if that has to happen, that he has to give up the nuclear in order for us all to live together. So I wonder. Um, if you've given that any thought. Let me just take two or three, if that's okay, Julie. Uh, thank you for that question, sir. Uh, yes, I am um, Kevin Shanley, uh, professor of history. Um, I recently had the pleasure of um, seeing and reading uh, Kevin Rudd's talk in Stockholm, and he made one very interesting... One of only two people in the world. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> he made a very, uh, many you interesting what? points. <laughs> regarding yeah. China and North Korea. He said, and I think I'm fairly close to what he said, that China has to be seen as doing everything she can to stop North Korea. But sooner or later, China's gonna throw up his hand, this is almost a quote, shrug and say to the United States, well, we did the best we can, and now you just have to live with North Korea as a nuclear power. Do I fairly quote you fairly close on that? That's uh, true, um, and that was just prior to the six nuclear tests. But go on and quickly a question, sir. Well, well, I, I would ask, well, does um, Ms. Bishop agree with that? Sure. And third question here, sir. Um, my question concerns the Great Barrier Reef, which is under severe attack from many ways. There is one way in which action could be taken. Right now, ships coming in normally dump their waste in the narrow channel 
giving access to the Queensland ports. Um, what could be done, I believe, is uh, from the 200 mile limit out, the amount of waste they should be expected to discharge could be estimated, and if they don't have that waste on board, they be charged double the cost. Uh, my question is, I think it makes sense, what can be done to bring about uh, some action on this? Okay, two on North Korea and one on the Great Barrier Reef. Okay, on North Korea, uh, history is always worth revisiting uh, to learn lessons. And back in 2003, China actually cut oil supply to North Korea for three days. North Korea came back to the six-party talks. Um, oil is the game changer and um, I don't believe uh, we've yet exhausted the sanctions options and that's where we have to head in order to bring them back to the negotiating table. I take your point that they want to have maximum leverage. Well, they've now undertaken about 88 illegal ballistic missile tests, now six nuclear tests. The scale and pace of them has... Um, increased exponentially. So I don't know that there's actually a point where North Korea can sit back and say, OK, we're now, we're now ready to sit down. I think we actually have to um, force it to the table, compel it to the table. As far as um, accepting uh, a nuclear-powered North Korea in terms of weapons, that is an unacceptable position to Japan South Korea and the United States, they all say that is unacceptable. Now, if you look at the end game for each of the countries involved or the relevant stakeholders, uh, what is China prepared to live with? What is the United States prepared to live with? Japan, South Korea. If North Korea is able to be a nuclearised state that will inevitably lead to Japan and South Korea going nuclear. Then we're talking about a proliferation, a proliferation race. That would be catastrophic. So I think that our best option at present is to maximise the pressure on North Korea to get to that negotiating table. I'm not um, being a Pollyanna about this, but I am hopeful that with China and the US not entirely on the same page, but, gee, closer than they've been in um, living memory on an issue like this, um, we'll see a breakthrough. In relation to the Great Barrier Reef, <coughs> uh, we are the custodians of one of the most magnificent, if the, not the most magnificent, coral reef in the world. It is the size of Germany or Italy off the Queensland coast of Kevin's home state, and it is absolutely vital as an ecosystem uh, protecting our coastline, um, part of our greenhouse gas emissions a reduction because coral reefs sequester four times what forests sequester. Uh, it's also an, an immense tourist attraction. So we treasure that Great Barrier Reef and we've invested $2 billion um, in the preservation and conservation and management of the reef. Um, it's a World Heritage Site. Uh, we have um, prevented dredging, um, in the, in the um, areas around it. We have prevented the, um, the runoff of, um, of uh, products from agriculture that were um, affecting it. Uh, we have done an enormous amount in regulating the environment around the reef. It's currently under stress because of a bleaching event that is going global you know, the warming of the ocean, it's going global. It's been in the Caribbean, it's now um, hitting, hitting the Great Barrier Reef. And in fact, I took um, about 80 of the Canberra-based diplomats um, from foreign embassies to the Great Barrier Reef in May to show them the bleaching event and what it has done. Now, parts of it um, will have died, other parts will um, survive. Um, but this is not just an issue for Australia, it's, it's for um, other nations as well. There are about 30... Um, World Heritage Council listed coral reefs around the world and 29 of them are under stress in one form or another. 
So we are applying absolute world's best practice to the preservation, conservation and management of the reef. The issue you raise is not one that's been um, brought to my attention about the, uh, the dumping of waste from these ships. And if that is occurring and it's impacting on the reef, I would be amazed that our Great Barrier Reef Authority, yeah. which is um, a very powerful body, hasn't done something about it. I'll certainly make inquiries, but I, I want to ensure you that um, we value um, our role as custodian of the Great Barrier Reef, um, and it's you know, one of the great wonders <coughs> of the world, and we intend for it to remain so. Now, friends, I'm conscious of the fact that uh, the Minister has appointments at the UN, and uh, New York traffic always being kind and benign at 5.15 in the afternoon. <laughs> on a Friday. Um, on a Friday, it means that it's a very easy ride on the subway. So, uh, so, um, uh, so let me just draw this conversation to a close by thanking the Minister for being here. Um, and um, to uh, make a little pitch as well. I forgot to mention this to you beforehand. Your speech spoke about preserving the long peace in Asia. Uh, we have just spent to the Asia Society the last uh, two years working on this. Um, and it's been put together by uh, a bunch of immediately past-serving foreign ministers and national security advisers. Tom Donnellan. Okay. Okay. <laughs> to Julie. I'll auction it at the next Liberal Party fundraiser. <laughs> and get five bucks for it. <laughs> Teresa again. <laughs> to Julie. Kiss, kiss, kiss. <laughs> the, um, the, uh, there you go. Um, but uh, it was put together with uh, former National Security Advisor of uh, India, Shiv Shankar Menon, who served in office until about two years ago, Martin Atalagawa, who you know from Indonesia, uh, Foreign Minister, former Foreign Minister Karaguchi of Japan, who uh, worked for um, Fukuda San, very close to Abe San, uh, former Foreign Minister Kim, who worked for Lee Myung Bak, yes. Uh, as well as um, Wang Ji Su on the Foreign Policy Board of the Chinese uh, Foreign Ministry. Uh, Igor Ivanov, the former foreign minister of Russia. Uh, did I mention Tom Donnellan here, the former national security advisor of the United States? And you'd be horrified to know I represented Australia. And, um, I'm proud to hear that, Kevin. The, um, a very glittering array of contributors. Well, it took a while, actually, to get some consensus, and we were helped enormously by Danny Russell here. Danny is the former Assistant Secretary of State for East Asia. Great and friend of Australia. Great friend of Australia, great friend of Asia. Um, and... Uh, has uh, joined us as scholar in residence, a diplomat in residence, I should say, here at the Asia Society Policy Institute, and is an enormous contributor to the work that we do. But essentially, what this argues in uh, one in less than thirty seconds is, uh, we've got all these geopolitical tensions across uh, the region. Uh, they've been long-standing. Some of them are coming to boiling points. We've seen East China Sea, South China Sea coming up and down and up again in recent years and North Korea, of course, uh, going through the roof. This simply argues um, that uh, by expanding the role of the East Asian Summit, of which mm. Australia is a member, we can actually build a more effective regional security-based institution for the future at head of government level, which establishes more concepts of common security across the region just to create a bit of ballast, a bit of uh, commonality across the neighbourhood, uh, almost taking ASEAN concepts of, uh, of security out more broadly rather than just being one bilateral tension rubbing up against another as we see constantly in the East China Sea and elsewhere. So I don't expect uh, any response from a document to a document that I've just given you Hang two on, minutes ago. Hang on, what's your view on the membership of the East Asia Summit? It's pretty good. As it is? Um, Would well, you expand it? Well, I think the 18, the biggest thing we did in office, I don't think you ever praised me for this in office, but the, uh, <laughs> the, uh, is that we finally persuaded uh, the neighbours to bring in the United States of America and Russia. Okay, one was the price for the other, but you have all the players around the table, don't you? I didn't praise you for that. No. The, uh, did you praise us for getting into it in the first place in 2006? Well, in 2006, some of us had to cajole your then Prime Minister, John Howard, <laughs> Oh, stop it. Yeah, anyway. Stop it. Okay. But the bottom line is, yeah. um, uh, this is not just... This a, is a unity ticket, actually. Yes, right. Yeah, it's, uh, there's some, some, some thoughtful work here. Yes. And given you had an East Asia Summit coming up, and I lobbied the same of the Philippines uh, Foreign Secretary last night, and they're hosting, um, could I just ask you to give it some thought? Absolutely, Kevin. Whatever you ask. <laughs> I know that response. <laughs>
Ladies and gentlemen, Australia is well served by Julie Bishop as its foreign minister, a big contributor to the security challenges of Asia, which is our home. And Julie, you and the Australian government are always welcome guests here at the Asia Society. Thank you for coming.